Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, and let us inspire ourselves for the discussion ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the United States Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. We have a series of wonderful programs coming up and it would be great if you could join. On December 3rd, keeping up the spirit of today's discussion, we discuss the founders and the classics with three of America's greatest scholars about the influence of the Greeks and Romans on the American founders. And on December 9th, Jane Mansbridge, author of the phenomenal book, which so influenced me when I was in law school, Why We Lost the NRA, uh, Why We Lost the ERA, not the NRA, uh, 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 joins Carol Robles Romain and Inez Felscher Stepman to debate whether or not we should revive the Equal Rights Amendment. And you can register for those programs at constitutioncenter.org forward slash debate. We'll be taking your questions throughout the show. So put them in the Q&A box, please. And I will ask them uh, as soon as that makes sense. And now it is such a pleasure to introduce our panelists. Barry Edelstein is the Erna Fincy Viterbi Artistic Director of the Old Globe Theater in San Diego. He is one of America's leading authorities on the works of Shakespeare and has written the superb book, Thinking Shakespeare, now the standard text on American Shakespearean acting. He's also the author of Bardism, Shakespeare for All Occasions. He's an acclaimed director who's previously served as director of the Shakespeare Initiative at the Public Theater um, and a dear old friend of mine from grad school. It's a, such a pleasure to see you, Barry. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me, Jeffrey. Kevin Hayes is Emeritus Professor at the University of Central Oklahoma. He's the author of many books about American literature and culture, including most recently, Shakespeare and the Making of America. Uh, and he is currently writing a book on the intellectual life of Benjamin Franklin. And Lucas Morell is John K. Boardman Professor of Politics at Washington and Lee University. He is the author most recently of Lincoln and the American Founding and a frequent uh, guest on National Constitution Center programs. Uh, uh, Kevin, it is wonderful to see you. Thank you. And Lucas, welcome back to the National Constitution Center. Thanks for the invitation, Jeffrey. Um, Barry, set the stage as it were for us. Um, Americans have turned to Shakespeare during moments of crisis throughout American history. Tell us how and why. Well, you know, Jeffrey, it's, it's really um, an extraordinary thing to trace just how deep Shakespeare runs in American political life and civic life. We think of Shakespeare as the national writer of England. He sailed across the ocean with those who settled the colonies and, and the, the new world in the early 17th century and never really left. And there's some, he's so deeply entwined in sort of every major moment, including the crazy crisis, the pandemic that we're in right now, that he sort of rises to a level of, of, of depth and, and I don't know, cultural pen penetration, if you will, that, that it's hard to imagine anything other than say, the US constitution and the Bible coming anywhere near, you know, and the famous, line about this in the early 19th century, the French philosopher de Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville took a tour of the United States in 1830s, I believe, and sort of uh, then wrote it up in a famous book called Democracy in America. And he said the famous line about there's scarcely a pioneer's hut where you can't find a copy of Shakespeare. He was everywhere. My two esteemed colleagues here know a lot more about the presidents of the United States and their relationship to Shakespeare than I do. But there again, it's hard to find an American president well, most of them that haven't quoted Shakespeare uh, in, in some way. And even in the last four years, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of keeping a little unofficial count of 
uh, commentators describing the Trump administration in some Shakespearean form. And the, I, I'm up to 12 different characters that, that the president has been compared to. So there's a, there's a deep link between these old plays and the American experience. I'm in the middle of it now as I try to pilot a Shakespeare, a, a, a theater that's famous for doing Shakespeare through this extraordinary crisis. And there's something about a, the kind of widespread connection to this material. Everybody has a little piece of it. It's in the common core. Um, there was some study in the 90s, as I recall, that said something like 92% of American students had read at least a little Shakespeare in high school. So even in the 21st century, everybody has some kind of relationship to Shakespeare. And he's one place where all different sides can meet. It's one of the very, very few things we have left in our culture that everybody can refer to. So when you have a huge crisis around the assassination of a president or a civil war or a gigantic riot on the streets of New York about post-colonial America's relationship to Britain, it's not surprising to find Shakespeare in there because he's the one thing that everyone can touch. He becomes a site of dispute, a site of disagreement. Sometimes, as in this moment, he becomes a place of solace and a place of hope. Uh, and it's just impossible to imagine civic life in America without this thread running through it. What uh, an inspiring introduction to our topic and what a striking quotation from Tokyo. There's hardly a pioneer's hut that does not contain a few odd volumes of Shakespeare. Yeah, we, we could ask how many pioneers huts he was hanging out in. I'm not, I'm not sure that's not sure that's where he was really spending his time, but uh, somebody told him that that was the case. I was so struck by the quote, I couldn't help but look it up. And he, he continues, I remember I read the feudal drama of Henry V for the first time in a log cabin. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. It's great. Um, uh, well, let us um, turn to uh, your superb new book, uh, Kevin. Hayes, and in Shakespeare and the Making of America, you both discuss how deeply marinated the founders were in Shakespeare and also how it was central to the ratification debate. You talk about how Federalists use Mark Antony as a pen name for refuting an essay uh, refuting Brutus and how both Mercy Otis Warren, the anti-Federalist and a uh, uh, friend of John Adams, invoke the tempest in questioning the consolidated nature of the Constitution and how the Federalist Papers themselves end with uh, both the famous uh, quotations from uh, uh, the, the St. Crispin Day speech, the Band of Brethren, and also Cardinal Wolsey's swan song in Henry VIII, whenever the dissolution of the Union arrives, America will have reason to exclaim in the words of the poet, farewell, a long farewell to all my greatness. Tell us about how invocations of Shakespeare pervaded the ratification debates. Well, uh, thank you. All, pretty much all of the uh, members of the Constitutional Convention had knew Shakespeare, read Shakespeare, had copies in, in their libraries at home. And uh, it was a kind of shared language. Uh, you, could, you could make a quotation from uh, Shakespeare and everyone would get the reference. Uh, and so this is something that uh, no matter what side of the debate that you were on, uh, that they shared. They, they shared a knowledge of Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare himself uh, did not represent the kind of constitutional uh, republic that, that we were forming. But, I mean, there's lots of little uh, speeches within Shakespeare that, that did express uh, kind of universal ideas that helped to uh, make... Um, make the founders, make the, the members of the Constitutional Convention, give them something uh, that they could uh, share. Now, um, one of the things that I looked at in my book is to look at all of the articles that were written after the uh, Constitutional Convention had ended and how people defended it or uh, denied it, or, uh, argued against it, and how many times Shakespeare was was being quoted and they quoted, uh, I mean, you mentioned Henry VIII, the Cardinal Woolsey's speech, but also too, there was the uh, Henry V, uh, Othello they quoted, um, and lots of, lots of Hamlet. It seems that the, the tragedies uh, 
and the histories were, were most often quoted, most often read. Uh, they, they knew the uh, comedies uh, less, although John Adams was a great, uh, <laughs> great fan of the comedies uh, and of all Shakespeare, really. Um, so it's, uh, Shakespeare just gave them a shared language that they could um, use to strengthen their arguments. And sometimes they quoted Shakespeare uh, verbatim, sometimes they kind of uh, force fit the quotations to suit their arguments, but uh, Shakespeare had good uh, rhetorical value and a quotation from Shakespeare was, was a, a uh, added strength to your argument. One of my favorite quotations, and this is not from the Constitutional Convention, but from uh, someone who was in the, uh, on, on the committee to draft the Declaration of Independence, Robert Livingston said, I would rather have one speech from Shakespeare than a thousand uh, books of Harrington or, or, or Sidney or Adams. A striking uh, sentiment, especially when you realize, as, as you note in your book, that Jefferson, when he's writing the Declaration, says that he's just synthesizing the ideas of Sidney, Bacon, and Locke. And of course, you describe in great detail how Jefferson had in his commonplace books extensive quotations from Shakespeare, and yet the notion that the, uh, a founder would say that the works of Shakespeare were, were worth more than all of that philosophy is striking indeed. Lucas, how, how do you account for the founder's devotion to Shakespeare in the founding era? And one of our attendees asked, does the fact that so many of the founders were lawyers and judges have something to do with their fascination for Shakespeare? Well, I think in general, it's safe to say that in Shakespeare, uh, the founders drew not just lessons on morality, but lessons on politics, at least in an indirect way. I, I see them as, uh, you know, the histories, as was mentioned earlier, and a few of the tragedies, um, they saw in those at least indirect object lessons, sort of a don't let this happen to you. Uh, it's, and we have the most outspoken, at least on paper, if you can be outspoken on paper, as was already mentioned in, in John Adams, my, my, my goodness, the correspondence between Adams and his wife, Abigail, uh, they, they drop uh, allusions, if not outright uh, quotations from Shakespeare left and right as if it was nothing. Uh, so in particular with Adams, you see someone who was concerned uh, about constitution making, having balance. And this is what precisely you lack in uh, the history plays in Shakespeare. We see the problems of not having say a written constitution, lacking consent, um, you know, prerogatives of whether lords or uh, the royal family that are unwritten, that these are things that lead to a contest for political legitimacy. Uh, the, the only play, I believe, where England is at peace with itself and with its neighbors is King Lear, <laughs> right? And so in Lear, you've got this play that sets itself up, not in terms of what would make for good rule, but what would make for legitimate succession. Who will follow Lear? Uh, is at least implicitly one of the themes of, of that great play. And what Adams and I believe the founders uh, drew from, from uh, a playwright who did not write about democracies was precisely the lessons that we need to have uh, to make sure that power, whether uh, wielded by the few or the many, uh, how power needs to be accountable, it needs to be transparent, and it needs to be um, structured, brings us to the constitution, in such a way that it cannot be wielded by either the few uh, uh, or the many um, without being balanced by um, others. Many thanks for that. And very interesting to note that uh, given the multiplicity of political views within Shakespeare himself, uh, the founders were able to extract from him a suspicion of concentrated power and to quote him so uh, repeatedly. Barry, tell us about the difference between the way Americans, especially in the 18th and 19th century, experienced Shakespeare on the page and in the theater. Uh, we have um, lots of examples of the founders quoting Shakespeare from memory, but Adams and uh, uh, saw him perform live in London. And then in the 19th century, as you and I have discussed at the Constitution Center, there was an explosion of performances of Shakespeare that were a kind of popular entertainment. So how did that affect the way Shakespeare um, infiltrated American culture? 
there are a huge amount of Shakespeare being performed in this country from the earliest times. In, in Williamsburg, Virginia, there were professional theaters. In uh, you know, Washington, D.C., in the 19th century, there were many, many theaters. We know that uh, during the gold rush, we know that the, the, the prospectors brought Shakespeare with them and put on little amateur theatricals, right? There's a famous story of Ulysses S. Grant when he was a grunt soldier in Texas dressing up been addressed to play Desdemona in a in a in a in a production on some army base in remote Texas. So Shakespeare has this double life even today in the library and in the theater. And that was true from the very, very earliest. Now one of one of the key points I think to make about this is how different Shakespeare in the theater and Shakespeare in the study really are. There's this misconception that we have even today that the works that we received in print from Shakespeare's period, the first folio in 1623, and productions that were uh, reached print half of Shakespeare's plays while he was alive, we tend to think that the theater then worked like it does today, where the script that we buy in a bookstore is exactly what was spoken on stage, because that's now in the contemporary American theater that's just gospel, right? The, the, the thing that reaches print is the thing that was said. Not true back then. And the, the life of a play in, on stage and the life of a play in print were extremely different. So much so that Shakespeare famously makes a joke about it in Hamlet where he tells the clowns not to say more than has been set down for them. And we know that the plays were shorter in performance than they, they were printed with a more complete version than would have been seen on stage. And so when you see Shakespeare borrowed for political ends, you see a kind of change to the text. The most famous example, of course, is Julius Caesar. One of the weird things about Julius Caesar is it's a play that does not tell you who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. If you read the play uncut, you can see plenty of reasons why it's a bad idea for Shakespeare, for Caesar, excuse me, to become this kind of soul king-like monarchical power. But then there's also a lot of uh, arguments in the play for why that's a good idea. You see plenty of arguments for why Brutus and the conspirators are doing a bad thing, but then you see a lot of arguments that make you say, yeah, they're kind of good. I remember when I directed the play in Central Park a number of years ago, I had a young nephew who was about eight or nine at the time come to see it and he asked me at the end, Uncle Barry, who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? The play doesn't wanna come down on either side. And that's what makes Shakespeare so useful to politicians. And we know uh, Julius Caesar was performed many, many times during the revolutionary period. My, my, my colleagues here will know more about that than I. But you'd have to cut the play to make a strong, unambiguous case for uh, killing somebody for deposing a tyrant because acts four and five of Shakespeare's play show, gee, that was a really bad idea to do that. So we, we know that what would, what would happen is a speech would be lifted out, right? Just as uh, uh, Professor Hayes said, these, these, the founders knew speeches, but pulled out of context, they can say very, very different things than when they're embedded in the overall context of the play. And the theater in the um, eight, late 18th and throughout the 19th century did that. Very liberal rewritings of the plays. So anybody who had a particular point of view that they wanted to make could just sort of extract the stuff that said the things that they wanted to say and then ignore the rest. And that's typically what happened. It's not until the really kind of early 20th centuries, 30s, 40s, where you start to see the tradition of Shakespeare on the American stage going back to fully uncut versions and where there's an intellectual armature that tolerates ambiguity in a different kind of way that allows both sides to kind of stand. So this, this, this deep theatrical presence of Shakespeare in America also comes with a deep freedom to say, I'm gonna pull from Shakespeare what it is that says the thing that I wanna say, and I'm gonna let the rest of it sort of lie on the cutting room floor. Such a powerful reminder of the impossibility of reducing a great theatrical performance to a simple political message as your uh, production of Julius Caesar showed, and uh, fascinating also that uh, as Shakespeare became less bodlerized in the uh, 20th century, there was more uh, tolerance for the complexity. Uh, Kevin, one of our uh, questioners, Kenneth Rose asked, did Ben Franklin quote Shakespeare? You have an entire uh, 
chapter of your book, Benjamin Franklin and the Governors, and you note that in Poor Richard's Almanac, he quoted, uh, proclaim not all that thou knowest, uh, uh, all that thou owest, all that thou hast uh, from, from Lear. Tell us more about how Franklin quoted him and, and then contrast him with perhaps a way that a Jefferson quoted him. It, it's striking that in Jefferson's commonplace book, we see extensive quotations from Shakespeare, but he seemed most Jefferson most drawn to Shakespeare for its moral uh, advice. What can we discern from the passages that individual Shakespeare uh, and individual founders were drawn to? Well, it's uh, uh, interesting to see Franklin uh, quote Shakespeare or make brief references to Shakespeare because uh, you know he's the he's the uh, creator of Poor Richard, and you can see that in his references to Shakespeare. Uh, they're they're very short, uh, um, and Othello was his favorite. I mean, just gauging by the number of references uh, in, in Franklin's writings, he made three or four references to Othello. Uh, but I also found references to to Lear and, and and Hamlet and a couple other plays in in Franklin. Um, now Franklin was also very. Uh, he was not one to, to cite his sources. I mean, he would he would draw from from his his vast reading, and uh, but wouldn't nece wouldn't necessarily say this is where I read it or this is where I got it from, and and so he was he was very much more subtle than others like like Adams in terms of citing his sources. Now, uh, Jefferson, if you mentioned the commonplace book, and uh, he has lots of quotations from Shakespeare in the commonplace book, but it's almost like what Barry was saying is that he, he just took them out of context or, or, or found something memorable that, that he liked and he wrote it down. One of the things I remember is that he, he took from uh, two different speeches uh, from two different characters and then combined them into one uh, transcript. I mean, he didn't, he didn't uh, write down who was saying what, he just found some a memorable quotation and it, it becomes, you know, like a, a Jefferson's version of Bartlett's quotations. Uh, he uh, found something he liked and, 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 and wrote it down without the context of the plays. Um, Washington, I think, was very similar to uh, Benjamin Franklin in terms of his, you know, he would read, read the plays and, and synthesize them and be able to uh, quote them from, from memory. But again, he, he didn't uh, didn't necessarily say, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote from Shakespeare. Uh, but then it becomes tricky in, in terms of analyzing the evidence. To what extent are these sayings from Shakespeare, have they already become proverbial and they're just part of the, uh, part of the culture or are, uh, are they being quoted directly for, as from, the, from Shakespeare? Now in Washington's case, I mean, that was probably the hardest one to decide, but in a couple of times I saw him quoting say two different uh, uh, speeches from Othello. So that made it more convincing that he had indeed read Othello. And Henry V, too, uh, you know, he quotes um, a couple different passages from Henry V, the St. Crispin's Day speech, and also the, the, the famous uh, um, Once More Through the Breach speech is, is another one that Washington quoted. Wonderful. Thank you uh, so much for all that. Uh, Lucas, you have written uh, extensively about the influence of Shakespeare on Lincoln. You note in uh, your piece on Charm World's Lincoln that uh, Carl Sandburg said, Lincoln uh, remarked, it matters not to me whether Shakespeare be well or ill acted with him, the thought suffices. And you go on to note that after seeing The Merchant of Venice played by Edwin Booth, Lincoln said, it was a good performance, but I had a thousand times rather read it at home if it were not for Booth's playing a farce or a comedy as best played, a tragedy as best read at home. Tell us about the overpoweringly important influence of Shakespeare on Lincoln. Yeah, with Shakespeare, of course, what Lincoln discovered there, um, in part informed by his great reading of the Bible, even though he wasn't a conventional uh, churchgoer or um, church member, I should rather say, he did go to church and actually rented a pew, but he'd never pledged membership. He wasn't a conventional uh, Christian believer, shall we say, but, but deeply steeped in the Bible. And of course, you see that suffused in Shakespeare. So in Shakespeare, uh, Lincoln is seeing someone who is not just rendering um, a morality plays, if you will, you're seeing someone teaching about the, the heights and depths, mostly the depths of, of what uh, especially great human beings uh, uh, can go, what they can achieve and how far they can fall. 
And Lincoln was moved by this. He, he went to Shakespeare for solace and consolation. He, Shakespeare was one of his chief escapes uh, from uh, the, the foibles and frailties and sins, if you will, of humanity all around him. Um, you, you cite uh, the Merchant of Venice. I mean, he cites the Merchant of Venice without quotation at a very pivotal time in our country's history. It's in May of 1862. He, has to, he chooses to revoke General Hunter's uh, proclamation of freedom to slaves in the southeastern part of America because Lincoln does not want it left up to generals to decide uh, what shall happen to at least the legal property of American citizens. And in fact, he is contemplating issuing an emancipation proclamation himself. And so in revoking the order, he issues a proclamation not just to, to revoke the order, it's a proclamation to the American people as a reminder of what he has been trying to do for months, which is to persuade the loyal so-called border slave states to adopt gradual emancipation plans in their own states. This is something that would not be sent to the Supreme Court. It would therefore be not open to constitutional challenge as it would, for example, the president of the United States liberating legal property under the constitution. And so he said, look, we have these great majorities of the House and the Senate have already passed uh, a bill that would, uh, would loan you the money to adopt gradual emancipation plans. And this is, this is what he says, He's, and this is the allusion to Merchant of Venice. He says, the change it contemplates would come gently as the dews of heaven not rending or wrecking anything. So right, the great line from the Merchant of Venice, the great speech on mercy, the quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as the gentle rain upon the place beneath. And I'll be corrected because I'm doing that from memory. Uh, right. And so Lincoln th thinks nothing of quoting Shakespeare here and presuming that his, his audience, the American people will understand, wow, <laughs> this is going to be, if you will, a political act uh, that, that is akin to an act of mercy, an act of grace, if you will, to have this done and, and in a way that he thinks will foreshorten the war. And of course, none of the states take him up on it. Um, but most famously, uh, Lincoln um, frequented plays as often as he could, not just Shakespearean plays, but uh, he was quite taken by this particular um, actor named James Hackett, uh, who sent Lincoln a book about um, uh, acting in Shakespeare. And uh, Lincoln decides out of all the things he could do, he's going to write back to this actor. And, and he says that um, some of Shakespeare's plays I have never read, while others I have gone over, perhaps as frequently as any unprofessional reader. And then he cites Lear, Richard III, Henry VIII, Hamlet, and then this astounding confession. He says, especially Macbeth. I think nothing equals Macbeth. It is wonderful. Now, if you know anything about Macbeth, <laughs> you'd think maybe that's the last play <laughs> a president of the United States should quote because it is about the, the ascension of uh, a, a devoted patriot uh, to the state who becomes, of course, uh, it, it issues his own coup d'etat, uh, kills Duncan and becomes a king himself. And uh, it is a play about ambition. And Lincoln, of course, uh, uh, was a man who was supremely ambitious, but thankfully, uh, conjoined with the soul that was supremely moral, in my opinion. Uh, so we, we lucked out on that one. But here's a guy speaking to a professional actor, uh, confessing uh, that he uh, thinks Macbeth, there's just nothing like it in, in, in Shakespeare. And of course, Hackett, being the scoundrel that he was, publishes this letter. And of course, Lincoln is ridiculed mercilessly uh, for, for saying what he did about these plays. So um, yeah, with, with, with Lincoln, uh, I think the quote that you began with is, is the best quote about with him, the thought suffices, right? There's watching the plays, that's great. But you know, with Lincoln, you see a guy who spent a lot of time reading and he loved to read out loud um, uh, and, and ad nauseum to the people around him and almost to sleep, if you will. So moving to think of Lincoln studying Shakespeare himself in his log cabin forming his great prose by his reading of Shakespeare. And uh, it, several have noted that uh, writing was so good and oratory in 19th century politics because people read Shakespeare and the Bible and Lincoln was the preeminent example. Barry, there are a bunch of questions about uh, performance history and education of Shakespeare in the 19th century. John Freed asks, uh, please ask one of the 
panelists to discuss the significance of the riot in New York City in 1849 that protested a performance of Macbeth with an English actor in the leading role. I don't know if you sure. happen to know about that incident, but and maybe extrapolate from that. If people are rioting over who's playing Macbeth, obviously this is hugely popular entertainment that people care a lot about. Uh, tell us how at the same time, Bonnie um, Harper Zedek asked, as public education emerged in the US with Shakespeare routinely taught him with their variations such as the geographic location of the school. So give us a sense of how Shakespeare is popular entertainment and, and, and uh, central to the curriculum in the 19th century. I will, and I'll, I'll try to be brief. We could do a, a whole panel on the Astor Place riots of 18, I think 45, it's the exact date's gonna slip my mind, 1847, something like that. First, let me just say, you know, when I teach actors, I use Lincoln to teach Shakespeare because one of Shakespeare's most famous tools, right? The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven is opposition or to use the rhetorical term antithesis. It's everywhere in Shakespeare to be or not to be. I come not to bury, I come not to praise Caesar, but to bury him, right? This sense of opposition. And of course, every famous Lincoln quote does that. The world shall little note nor long remember what we say here, but it shall never forget what they did here. Uh, again and again and again. And so for me, what's a lot of fun is that when I'm introducing students, acting students to this idea of antithesis, I wheel out Lincoln speeches. Um, and and uh, you know, not that he was emulating Shakespeare consciously, but it's impossible for me to imagine that a guy who was as steeped in Shakespeare as he was didn't unconsciously find those kind of Shakespearean rhythms working their way into his own writing. So that's a, sorry about, that's not the question you asked. So the, 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 the Astor Place riots have a big Philadelphia connection because they, they um, revolved around this actor named Edwin Forrest, who was a Philadelphian uh, and uh, left his home to indigent actors on Walnut Street and owned a copy of the Shakespeare First Folio, which, is, which was burned in a fire and, and is in the library of the University of Pennsylvania, a great Philadelphian. And he was the most famous American actor of the the 19th, early 19th century, maybe the first national superstar actor, big guy, very muscular, big features, was known for his extravagantly athletic, over-emotional, very, very robust style and very, very manly. And there's a lot of stuff tied in about early American ideas about masculinity. The greatest English actor of the time was a guy named Macready, William Charles Macready, who was, you know, if you were to design the opposite of Forrest, you'd have a harder time coming up with somebody as exact. If feet, um, intellectual, poetic, uh, sort of light on his feet in his acting style, uh, notorious for his very, very ornate, complicated um, interpretations of moments in Shakespeare. He's famous for a, for a mad dance with a handkerchief as Hamlet and uh, Forrest went to Scotland to go see Macready perform this and stood up in the middle of the theater and hissed him when Macready did this handkerchief dance. So they hated each other, the, the rivals. As it turns out, they were scheduled to do performances of Shakespeare blocks from each other. Forrest on the Bowery in New York City, Macready in the Astor Opera House, which stands right around the corner from where the public theater is today. This great home of American Shakespeare stands right around the corner from where this thing took place. The Astor Opera House was the place where the fancy, wealthy, very pro-English aristocratic New Yorkers came. Whereas the theater that Forrest played in on the Bowery was a place for working Americans and also very heavily Irish who hated the English. So there was this huge class distinction going on between the, the fancy toffs who were pat patronizing Macready, the effete Englishmen playing Shakespeare uh, versus the working masculine tough guy sort of boisterous loud Americans around the corner. There was also a lot of other stuff tied in around uh, war debt um, uh, and a terrible time in Anglo-British relations then that had all sorts of political ramifications going on. I'm, I'm giving the story very, very short shrift. And there are a couple of really good books about it that go into the political disputes. And so uh, Forrest became this kind of boisterous populist, nativist, and Macready became the kind of cosmopolitan internationalist. And Forrest's people went and protested at uh, 
at McCready's Theater. It didn't quite work out. They, they planned a second protest a couple of days later that erupted into violence, gunfire. I think 30 or 35 people ended up dead on the streets of New York outside. This incredibly violent was at the time the worst piece of the worst moment of civil unrest in America. And what was in the middle of it? Shakespeare. Shakespeare and ideas about who owned Shakespeare, Shakespeare and ideas about how the culture gets constituted. So I wanna refer everybody to go read more about the Astor Place riots. It's, uh, it's one of the most extraordinary episodes in 19th century America. And also the figure of Edwin Forrest, who in this moment of a renewed surge of populism and anti-intellectualism in American politics, Edwin Forrest was there way, way, way before. Extremely interesting character, full of, full of wonderful vignettes. And, and, uh, and, and in many ways, just as one little footnote, it was after that riot that the New York City police began to arm themselves. So, right, that was the first moment in American history when policemen armed themselves. So you see these strange Shakespeare things uh, uh, that, that, that were still, you know, armed police on the streets of New York, controversial today. And it sort of traces its back to this place where Shakespeare is kind of the, the pebble in the shoe, if you will. Oh, what a marvelous telling of the significance of the Astor Place Prize. Thank you so much for that. Thanks for your suggestion of further reading. And Sid Fox notes that uh, James Shapiro's Shakespeare in a Divided America talks about the Astor Place Riots, uh, so that would be good. Indeed he does. Uh, um, uh, Kevin, Kevin, tell us, uh, we have several questions about um, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists and their invocation of Shakespeare. And we, Derek Webb asked, do we know whether the Anti-Federalists cited Shakespeare in criticism of the proposed constitution? You give several examples of uh, those who did, as well as whether Hamilton and other Federalists cited Shakespeare. So, um, and, and you note that both sides uh, would call themselves Brutus at different times. George Washington, when he was uh, criticizing King George, uh, in opposition to the Caesar of, of George, and then the Anti-Federalists when they were uh, criticizing the Federalists. So, so tell us about um, those dueling quotations. Okay. Well, when I was uh, looking into the Constitution and the relationship to Shakespeare, I did notice that uh, James Madison had a copy of Hamlet in his library. Now, I suspect he read more than that, uh, but as far as I know, that the, uh, that's the only one Shakespeare volume that, that Madison had in his library. Now, um, in the, the Federalist Papers, well, we talked about this a little bit earlier, that uh, John Jay, who wrote Federalist number two, quoted two different Shakespeare plays, the, the Henry V and also Henry VIII. Um, there's not, in, in the Federalist Papers, there's not too many other Shakespeare quotations, but the Federalist Papers were just one of many uh, newspaper articles uh, after the Constitutional Convention. I mean, there were, news, there were articles in every newspaper uh, throughout uh, early America, either defending the, the Constitution or, or arguing against the Constitution. I think that probably uh, Julius Caesar was the most often uh, quoted play. And, and Brutus came out came out the best. Brutus really came out better than any of the other characters in, in Julius Caesar. Uh, more people identified with Brutus and, and thought he was, uh, he was he was the one good guy in there. Uh, uh, he was uh, he, he was trying to defeat Caesar, uh, overthrow Caesar, but he had he had motives behind it where all the other ones were just kind of going along with it or, or doing it for their own self-aggrandizement, whereas Brutus had more unselfish motives. And so he gets quoted a lot. Uh, especially by the uh, people on the uh, pro-constitution side. Um, but I also uh, saw lots of quotations from um, Othello too, and uh, Hamlet, uh, the, the to be or not to be speech, is which is what I end my book with, is, is quoted uh, more often probably than any other speech in, in that uh, the arguments for the constitution and it really is. I mean, it's an it's an existential question. It's absolutely applicable. Is is this nation is is this new nation going to be or is it going not to be? And so I think that the the simplicity of of the well, it's the simplicity of the question and the complexity of the underlying uh, ideas uh, behind the question uh, 
uh, really appealed to uh, to early Americans who were, were arguing the importance of, of establishing a new and, and strong government. Fascinating, thank you for all that. Uh, um, uh, Lu Lu Lucas, um, we have a question about whether Shakespeare, from Janice uh, Sumler Edmund, about whether Shakespeare informed the slavery issue, either at the founding or during the antebellum issue, and then use that to maybe tell us whether Lincoln's reading of Shakespeare informs his thoughts about slavery. You have a completely fascinating passage about how Lincoln considered uh, the abortive prayer of Claudius over, um, thought that that was more uh, important than the uh, more famous Hamlet soliloquy, and that Lincoln found in Shakespeare a uh, sort of complicated view of Christianity that was um, relevant to Lincoln's thinking. So uh, d disentangle the influence of <laughs> the declaration and uh, the founders on Lincoln uh, to the influence of Shakespeare and tell us whether it influenced his thinking about slavery. Sure, um, beginning with that first question uh, in terms of the anti-slavery movement, uh, Frederick Douglass quoted Shakespeare probably 10 times as often as Lincoln did. And his were either explicit quotations in quotations or, or in, in a number of allusions. And so, uh, Douglas, like Lincoln, right, they were autodidacts. They were chiefly self-taught. Uh, and so they, they share that background and, and upbringing, if you will. Um, uh, by far, of course, Douglas uh, having the more difficult go at it because he was uh, legally enslaved um, uh, until he, he escaped when he was 20. Um, and so uh, the quoting of Shakespeare uh, was uh, 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 fairly, um, uh, I don't know if it was commonplace. I haven't, you know, exhausted my reading of the abolitionists, but it was certainly one that uh, that Frederick Douglass, who who wrote the King's English, if you will, uh, it came to him uh, readily, and um, so I'll, I'll just leave that at that. In in terms of of Lincoln, it's the same letter to Hackett where he mentions he 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 uh, closes by asking Hackett, you know, to be or not to be, you know, is the most popular. Uh, most famous uh, speech from Shakespeare. Uh, but I think the one that you mentioned, right? The King Claudius speech that begins, oh, my offenses rank, where he's, he's, this, he's trying to confess his sin, but he realizes I like the fruit of my sin too much. Uh, and so it, it is an abortive prayer. And, and, and Lincoln loved that. He says, this is humanity. We want to do well. We recognize, unless we're completely corrupt, uh, we recognize our baseness, our sinfulness, our frailty, our willfulness, but darn it, <laughs> sometimes the goods that we get from it uh, still taste sweet. And uh, Lincoln thinks, I think we can extrapolate from that uh, soliloquy, that prayer of, of Claudius, uh, an analog that Lincoln drew to American slavery. Here was a country that at least in Lincoln's mind began by acknowledging this is evil. But it's a long-standing one, what I call a pre-existing condition, if you will. It's one we could not rend ourselves from or extricate ourselves from immediately, but one that we knew we needed to get rid of to be consistent with our republic. And a, 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 sla a slaveholding republic is a contradiction in terms. And so they did what they could to prevent slavery from further entrenching itself, right? Cutting off its importation in 1808 and then banning it in the only territory that they had held the Northwest Territory um, in 1787, and it was re up by the first Congress. Uh, but then, of course, the invention of the cotton gin in 1792, 93, uh, threw that out the window, and it became too lucrative. Um, even though it was uh, abolished um, uh, principally through gradual emancipation in six out of the original 13 states, and Vermont came in with you know, the 14th state as, as an anti-slavery state, anti-slavery constitution. But darn it, we're, we're, we're stuck. And, and we've got this slavery, it's, it's, it's too good to get rid of, and yet we know in our heart of hearts that it is wrong. And so Lincoln wants to know from this actor, what do you think, uh, to be or not to be? Yes, it flows trippingly across the tongue, but boy, the one that really gets at the soul of the human condition is not whether one is contemplating suicide, which by the way, Lincoln as a melancholic, uh, it, it's, Odds are he did contemplate that time and time again because he was congenitally depressed. 
um, for him to say not to be or not to be, but the, oh, my offenses rank soliloquy. That's the one we really need to mull over. I think he is um, bearing the soul of the nation to hack it in, in, in saying that this is our problem. Uh, our problem with slavery, uh, we recognize it as a problem and the tragedy, the great tragedy of America is we couldn't get rid of it peacefully, which is to say politically. It came to a war and a war that he confesses himself later, second inaugural most explicitly, but then after the second inaugural in a letter to Thurlow Wee, he confesses, I didn't even begin this war of self-defense in an effort to get rid of slavery, right? It was, an, it was an outcome that no one seriously expected. Wow, so powerful. Thank you for that. Barry, several of our friends in the Q&A are asking, when did Shakespeare in America gradually cease to become blockbuster entertainment and become perceived as highbrow stuff for high school and educated people? Uh, does quoting Shakespeare fall off precipitously post Lincoln? And then uh, when did he stop being taught in schools routinely? Um, and then to give us a sense of the present, uh, a time when Shakespeare is less taught and less considered blockbuster entertainment than it was in the 19th, maybe you'd like to share with us your experience as teaching Shakespeare in prisons. Sure. Um, well, you know, we have sort of the great 20th century apotheosis of mass. Shakespeare would be Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the radio. And um, you even see... Uh, Lucille Ball trying to act with Orson Welles on an, uh, an episode of I Love Lucy, right? There. So Orson Welles, I would, uh, you know, this is a little armchair here, so forgive me, but that's kind of the, the end point of mass popular Shakespeare. After that, you start looking at movies of Shakespeare, they perform terribly, right? They, they, they even things that we think of like uh, Kenneth Branagh's Henry V, a, a great, incredibly successful Shakespeare movie, made $20 million, right? The, 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 somewhere in the post Orson Welles, post war American world of entertainment, Shakespeare precipitously declines. Um, uh, you know, uh, you'd have to get cultural critics to help unpack it more, but I'm sure the rise of television has a huge amount to do with this. I'm sure the decline of reading generally has a huge amount to do with this. Um, however, I would say that it's not the case necessarily that Shakespeare is still not taught. I, I, he's on the Common Core, and that would make him pretty much the, the only writer that's universally taught in school systems around the country that follow the Common Core. And again, I, maybe my colleagues will remember when this was. There was some survey, I'm going to say late 1980s, early 1990s, that said that 90-something percent of American students had read Shakespeare. It's also true and this will tie it back to what I do for a living, there are, there are a huge number of Shakespeare theaters around the United States. Now, we are, uh, uh, we're, we're um, you know, a very sort of niche art form. Um, last year, in 2019, 30 million Americans bought theater tickets. Compared to the number of people who bought movie tickets, that's a very, very small number. Uh, a success at the Old Globe of a Shakespeare play will be seen by 30,000 people. That will be a monumental world-shaking success for a, a major Shakespeare theater like the Old Globe. And those numbers are tiny compared to what you would reach on television or what you would reach in the movies. So. I think you have to look at sort of 40s and 50s when you start to see a real earthquake happen and the society generally uh, move away from, from a kind of reader culture, a, a Shakespeare culture. But, but let, me, let me tie this back into the, uh, the second part of the question you asked. Now, the Old Globe, we are the, at least before COVID, we were the third largest regional theater in America. And one of the things that we do in addition to putting on a lot of plays is something that we call arts engagement, where we bring theater to disenfranchised, um, mar marginalized, underserved populations around San Diego County. And, and we serve refugees, seniors, uh, the homeless, um, veterans, uh, populations that for whatever reason don't enjoy regular access to the to our to our shows in our headquarters in Balboa Park because those tickets are expensive or because you physically have to be able to get there. 
And we have an extremely robust, one of the country's leading programs of theater with incarcerated populations. And all of that work circles around Shakespeare. In fact, we just received a huge grant from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation to run Shakespeare programs in state prisons in California. Right now in COVID, it's on television. There's a closed circuit television system in the state penitentiary system, and that's where we are. And it's all about Shakespeare. And the question is why? Why is Shakespeare speaking to incarcerated populations as eloquently as he does? On one level, it's about emotional intelligence and the same things that made Shakespeare appealing to Lincoln. You know, you, you wanna talk about guilt, you wanna talk about loss, you wanna talk about family, you wanna talk about violence and whether or not it is a useful strategy to achieve progress and to get what you want. Well, you're gonna find all that stuff in Shakespeare. And uh, you know, one of my favorite stories is seeing a guy do Romeo's banished speech. He has a long speech about being banished, banished shed as Shakespeare writes it. And, you know, I've never seen the speech done more powerfully than by a guy who is living the life of a man who's banished behind bars, put away for decades, talking of Romeo's language of banishment. For me, it's not about Shakespeare as a means of self-improvement. We're not bringing Shakespeare to penitentiaries to sort of make people better. We're bringing Shakespeare to penitentiaries to help people find voices for themselves. In Shakespeare, they can find ways to express things that they maybe aren't able to express themselves. They find a language that puts spe specific expression to their own thoughts, to their own feelings that perhaps they're not able to find without that help. And so Shakespeare becomes a meeting place. Shakespeare becomes a place of gathering, a place where people can find a version of themselves and their own story that they can't necessarily find within. And I can report to everybody, maybe he's not thriving so well in the cinema, maybe he's become a little marginalized in our reading, but in the world of the, the, the prison system, the refugee community here in Southern California, the homeless community here in Southern California, the Globe, other theaters like us, keeping Shakespeare very, very much alive because he is a place where people can find their experience in a, in a way more eloquent than anywhere else that they can look. What an inspiring story of the banished speech and what heartening uh, report that uh, Shakespeare remains so powerful as a means of emotional expression in the prisons and remains as relevant to the American experience uh, thanks to your path breaking educational efforts. Uh, Lorna Grenadier uh, reports, I just heard President Obama cite the impact of Shakespeare's tragedies um, I would say Shakespeare said President Obama continues to be a touchstone. I think he's foundational for me in understanding how certain patterns repeat themselves and play themselves out between human beings. Um, Kevin, uh, what um, Barry draws an interesting distinction between Shakespeare as self-improvement and Shakespeare as a means of emotional expression or conveying a sense of the arc of history. What was he for the founders? Um, and maybe share with us uh, in, in, in our final round, some of what you think some of the most significant invitation of Shakespeare by the founders was. Well, Shakespeare really satisfied the dual purpose of literature in the 18th century. I mean, this was, a, this was the time before art for art's sake. This was a time when uh, people believed that any work of good literature had to do two things. It had to both delight and instruct. And anyone that didn't do, uh, didn't instruct uh, was not as good as one that did both delighting and instructing. And, and uh, for readers in the 18th century, Shakespeare uh, did both. And, and so they, you know, he was very much appreciated for that. I think that one reason why his history plays and his tragedies were more, uh, more liked and more read than his comedies was because they did uh, instruct more than, than, just, than just delight. One of the one of my favorite references to Shakespeare in Jefferson's writings, uh, and he's giving some advice to a, a young uh, uh, young student who's looking to read more and, and wanting some advice about what to read. And Jefferson says, "Oh, you don't need to read moral philosophy. Uh, you know, our our God has given us the the 
natural ability to understand the, what's right from wrong, understand moral philosophy. And if you want to, if you want to know more about moral philosophy, just read King Lear. Uh, and so uh, Shakespeare was very much a, a way to to enjoy reading, but but to learn some of the fundamental uh, ideas about how humans should behave uh, toward one another and and how they should act and, and what happens if you if you don't respect your fellow man and and you usurp his, his powers. And, and so I think that. Um, that's true for Jefferson. I think it's true for Washington and Adams and, and many of the founders, probably perhaps all of the founders who read Shakespeare. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, Lucas, um, I guess I'll ask you a version of the same question. What, was, what were the invocations of uh, Shakespeare by Lincoln or Douglas or other Civil War era figures that were most significant, and are there particular moments that really crystallized the crisis um, through Shakespeare in ways that you'd like to uh, share with the audience? Well, I, I have to, uh, if you had asked me, what is two plus two, my answer would still be the second inaugural address. <laughs> 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 I, I think that is the most sublime, uh, sui generis uh, political speech by an American president, perhaps by any politician in American history, and um, I believe that the inspiration for at least the, the most harrowing part of the second inaugural where he talks about the possibility that God might be using the war as a scourge, as a punishment upon both sides for uh, you know, 250 years of the bondman's toil, right? A quarter of a millennium uh, for you know, exploiting um, the labor of this particular race of uh, people on American soil. I think Lincoln, um, uh, I mean, it's an understatement to say that Lincoln set the bar high for himself in a political speech, which Frederick Douglass said sounded more like a sermon uh, than a state paper. Uh, but I, there, I'm going to have to cite another abortive prayer, and it's the final prayer of Henry V, uh, right before the battle where the odds are massively against them. And he's trying to get God on his side. <laughs> he's, he's trying to uh, get the, the God on a side of a war that he uh, unjustly provoked, as Shakespeare prevents it, uh, presents it. And he tries to share with God, look, all these good things that I've done. I'm paying for people to pray in these chantries. And he's got this wonderful passage. And I'm going to get back to the second inaugural as a result. This is what Henry says. Oh, not today. Think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. I, Richard's body, have interred anew, and on it have bestowed more contrite tears than from it issued forth of blood. That contrast of tears, Henry V crying over the dead body in contrast uh, with blood, I think possibly suggested this from Lincoln. If God wills, that it continue the war until all the bondman's wealth, right? 250 years of unrequired toil should be sunk and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3000 years ago, so still it must be said the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Here is a president, the first time confessing that slavery is wrong in public to the nation and saying we might be getting punished for this thing that has been going on for so long in this country. But now with the Emancipation Proclamation and the passage of the 13th Amendment, which is on its way to ratification in March of 1865, it happens eventually in December, Lincoln is showing the justice that God may be exacting upon America for expropriating this labor of the lives of so many black people in a war that it, right now, every time we count, it goes up, right? It's you know three quarters of a million people that lost their lives. Lincoln says, if the war were to continue, but as we know, it doesn't continue. It only continues for about four or five more weeks and it's over. He says, if it were to continue, the believers in a living God would say, well, yeah, this sounds like the God that we're familiar with in the Bible. But the fact that it's about to be ended as Lincoln knows everybody knows in March and everybody's thinking of reconstruction. What Lincoln is actually saying is this we must count as an act of mercy on God's part 
precisely because he doesn't let this war go on indefinitely. But for that passage in the second inaugural, the last paragraph and the last sentence, which is the most famous part of the second inaugural, would follow as a non sequitur, right? With malice toward none, with charity for all. You don't get to that without showing this depiction of God's character as one who is both just and merciful. And as he says, right, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, but came to different conclusions about the justice of slavery. He says, if that's your God, perhaps at, as this war comes to a close, we should all start acting a lot more like him. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Barry Edelstein. Kevin Hayes and Lucas Morrell for an inspiring discussion of the relevance of Shakespeare to the founders in American history. Thank you friends for joining for an hour to learn together and your homework if you choose to expect it, accept it is to read the books of these great uh, scholars. Um, Barry Edelstein's thinking Shakespeare, Kevin Haynes' Shakespeare and the making of America and Lucas Morrell's Lincoln and the American founding and of course Dear friends of the National Constitution Center, let us together read the works of Shakespeare. Thank you so much and see you soon.